Yes, yes, I have. But I found happiness because I found uh, the man that I think that's right for me. I didn't marry until I was 30 years old. And uh, my father had always been very strict with me. I didn't date until I was 16 years old. And I couldn't go steady. And I know when I went off to the University of Mississippi as a freshman, all the girls were complaining because they had to be in at 10.30 at night. And I thought it was wonderful because we, I got to stay out later. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and it took me a long time to find that, uh, that special person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was very fortunate either God or fate took care of me and somehow I didn't settle along the way. You know. I met my husband and I, I knew I think the moment I saw him that he was the one I'd been waiting for. I know that oh. sounds like a Hollywood script, but it truly happened that way. And uh, he's very down to earth, very honest, and uh, a wonderful father. I know it probably sounds all very boring, but uh, yes, Mary Clancy Collins, who will be seven years old next month, uh, she's named for her great-grandfather, William Clancy Farish, and she's a true Clancy. She loves horses, and she loves the out of doors. Well, I consider myself a Mississippian who now lives in California because of my occupation. If you are a Robert Redford or a Steve McQueen, you can live anywhere in the world because you know what pictures you're going to be doing for the next three years. But my husband and I both do episodic television. By that, I mean we'll guest on a Canon or um, a Streets of San Francisco. And he was doing a series. Uh, so you have to live in Los Angeles to do that. Of course. But hopefully we would one day like to have a farm or a ranch or just acreage here in Mississippi and spend half of our time, if not the summers, here in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. My husband had never been to Mississippi until we got married, yeah. and he really loves it. His favorite dish now is turnip greens. <laughs> but you were asking about the difference. I grew up in a very, a very protected environment. We had Sunday school, church, Methodist Youth Fellowship and then Sunday night service. And then we had Wednesday night prayer meeting and then after prayer meeting we had choir practice. I grew up in a very, what I now look back on as a very lovely environment. It was uh, full of love from all the neighbors. And, and uh, I grew up feeling that I had a responsibility not just to my parents, but to uh, the people of Brandon, Mississippi. It's like we were all growing up together. And I think that's a nice feeling. When I moved to New York and then later to California, there is not that closeness. And at first I wanted to blame it on a different style of living. And then I realized there are those people who live in California, in Los Angeles, and in my business who really don't live any differently than I lived in Brandon, Mississippi. It's just that you have to look harder to find those people. And I think that you have to keep searching as an individual until you find those people who feel the same way that you feel about things. And I'm talking about the important things. I'm talking about love and marriage and fidelity in marriage and how you're going to raise your child and what values your child will have. My daughter is still being taught to say yes ma'am and no ma'am and please and thank you. And I've run into people who say, you should not ask your child to say yes ma'am. And I said, well to me it's, it's important. That's the way I was brought up and I want her to say yes ma'am and no ma'am. I think it's a respect that children should have for their elders. So I do run into that occasionally, people who disagree with the way I was brought up and that I in turn am bringing up my daughter. But I don't think I have to please everybody else. I think I have to find what works for us as a family. Well, when we got married, I had been single for a long time, so I knew I wasn't giving up anything. And I decided that his had to be the main career. 
And uh, I have never taken a job that took me away from, from Clancy or Gary for longer than a week. I have come here to Mississippi to do different appearances and I may be gone for five days. But generally, we all go together. When Clancy was 10 months old, my husband did a movie in Hong Kong. And I was really crushed. I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to leave my 10-month-old daughter. I didn't want my husband to go away for two and a half months without me. And I thought, what are we going to do? So we voted and we decided we're all going together. And I said to my pediatrician, well, is it going to hurt? Clancy, I mean, she's going to have to have cholera and yellow fever and all of this. And he says, believe me, it's going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt Clancy. And he was right. <laughs> and uh, she had her first birthday in, uh, in Hong Kong and then in Japan. Then uh, her second birthday, I believe, was in Hawaii. Her third and fourth were in California. Her fifth was in London and her sixth was in Africa. And I don't know where her seventh is going to be. But we generally all try to go together because I've decided that that's the lesser of maybe three evils for my daughter. One, I could leave her at home with uh, grandparents and she could stay in school. The second, I could stay at home and let my husband go off. Uh, thirdly, we all go together. We take a tutor or we arrange to have a tutor wherever we are and we all stay together and that's what we've opted for. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's very hard on a marriage, especially in our business, to be separated. I, I just don't think you can be blasé about it and if you want your marriage to work and if you want to keep close to your child and know what's happening and know what thought she's thinking, I think you have to stay together. I think so. You know, uh, I don't think I'm superstitious. And I say that I'm not superstitious. And I'll walk on the ladders. But when I say something like that, I, I look a very special man. And I must say it gets better every year. And that I don't say because you and I are talking and we're on television. Mm -hmm. I can say that quite, quite honestly. And I don't think I deserve any, uh, any credit. I think I've been very lucky. I think all through my life I've been very lucky. Yes. It's... Um, it's a little different. Uh, we, we go to, I'm a Methodist, but we found a Presbyterian church that we like very much because the minister is very young. His name is Don Mumaw. He was um, an Olympic athlete at UCLA, and he's this, this tall, virile young man who gets in and he says his sermons with a smile, and uh, we have more young people in that church. And I think that's the way you can judge the success of a church and of a minister. Because in these troubled times for young people, if you can have a large number of young people in the congregation, that means that you're meeting their needs. And I think with all the, the temptation, with all the other things pulling on young people right now, it's quite a compliment to the minister and the church when you see so, mu so many of them involved in church life. Yes, I don't want to embarrass her, but my mother is probably the person who has influenced my life the most. I've not always agreed with her, and I don't know any daughter that's ever agreed wholeheartedly with, with their mother, but she has been the the guiding force. She's been the one responsible for, I think, any success that I have achieved. I can remember one time I was asked to, to enter a speech contest in Rankin County. And I was lazy, I guess. I didn't, I didn't want to work on a three-minute speech that you had to memorize and then get up and say in front of a panel of judges. And my mother said, yeah, I think you would. I think you'd be very pleased that you have done this mm -hmm. once it's all over. And I said, oh. So I ended up doing it for my mother, mainly. But I ended up being so pleased with the results, and I was lucky enough to win. I don't think there were that many contestants, really. But it started me thinking about a career in show business. It started me thinking about a career in speaking and I, it just did wonders for me and I probably would never have done it if 
if my mother hadn't encouraged me in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try to remember these things when I'm dealing with my daughter. Because mm -hmm. I think you tend to do the things you approved of, I mean, the things that you approved that your mother did, and then uh, going the opposite way when things that you didn't approve of. But um, I don't want to embarrass her because she's sitting here in the audience. But uh, my mother has been the guiding force in my life. She's a, a very special lady. Can I tell one story on her? I don't know whether she's going to approve of this. Uh, once we, uh, we were building a house in Brandon. In the meantime, we were living with some very dear friends who had uh, a big antebellum house about two miles outside of Brandon called Busick Wells. And the Busicks were very dear friends of ours, and they had this huge antebellum home with two stories, you know, like 15 rooms downstairs and 15 rooms upstairs. And they said, while you're building your home, why don't, why don't you take the upstairs and live there? And we said, fine. And uh, my stepfather was out of town. Uh, uh, he was checking uh, uh, land titles. He was working mm -hmm. for Gulf Oil at that time, a lawyer for Gulf mm -hmm. Oil. And he was out of town, and I was having a big dance recital. Now, in a small town, most of your activities revolve around the church and the school. And there was to be a big ballet recital at the high school auditorium. And I must have been, what, nine years old? And I had a little solo. Now, at nine years of age, nothing in your life that's going to happen in the future is going to be as important as that night. And so it rained all that day. And my mother and I went to get in the car to drive to the high school auditorium for my ballet recital. And we got stuck. And no daddy there. And I am in tears. And my mother said to me, don't you worry. I'll get you to that dancing recital. And she went to the stables, and she saddled a horse. Oh, really? And she put me up <laughs> behind her, and we got to the dancing recital. Besides being a very loving lady, mm -hmm. and she always put her children first, and we always knew that we were first in her life over bridge games and parties. Mm -hmm. And that's a very special feeling growing up as a child. Well, I'm in involved uh, a little bit selfishly in the Mississippi Prevention of Blindness Society. Uh, let me digress just a little bit. The Mississippi uh, Prevention of Blindness Society is something that is operated solely on voluntary funds. Uh, they only have three paid employees over the entire state. And uh, they have three main goals. One is to educate employers to be more conscious of eye safety and to promote eye safety on the job. Also, uh, we have lecturers and film clips, all sorts of people who are available to go out and speak to women's group, men's group, school groups, any organization that would like to have information on eye safety, we have that available free of charge. It's only a telephone call away. The third thing that we do, and I'm using the editorial we, if I may, is they have a program to go out and screen preschool children for eye problems. And the thing that's so important about that is that so many eye problems, if they're caught at an early age can be so easily corrected and they can prevent permanent eye damage and blindness. Also, so many children that we might think have a learning disability. Johnny isn't learning very easily. He's not comprehending what he reads. Johnny might have a sight problem and that's the reason why he is not understanding, why he's not making good grades. And I had that come home to me and my own family, uh, not making good grades because, thank goodness, my, my daughter, and I don't know where she gets it, is a straight-A student. But my husband said to me one day, Marianne, look at Clancy's left eye. I don't think it's tracking in correlation with the right eye. And I said, I don't see a thing. So when I took her in for her uh, checkup with the pediatrician, I said, will you please look at the left eye? Gary says it seems to be a lazy muscle. 
the pediatrician said, no, I don't see anything. And I said, well, just to um, ease Gary's mind, let's make an appointment. So I made an appointment with a specialist. He says she has 20-20 vision, but she does have uh, a slight problem with the muscle in the left eye. I believe it's called amliopia. And hers was terribly slight. It just took six weeks of um, eye exercises, and she was perfect again. But you can have amliopia in, in different uh, stages of severity, some requiring operations. But it, if it is not caught in time, it weakens the other eye because the other eye is having to compensate for the lazy muscle in the other eye. Mm -hmm. And after a certain age, it cannot be, uh, be corrected. And so many problems that later results in blindness can be corrected at an early age. And the Mississippi Society for the Prevention of Blindness does this free of charge. We have a lot of ladies here in the Junior League who are trained to go out and do these preschool screening tests. They give of their time and we provide all of the equipment and the training necessary. And I think if we could just stress to parents and to schools, to superintendents, to kindergarten teachers. Uh, please take advantage of this facility and that's uh, available at no cost whatsoever because a lot of heartache could be prevented at a, a very early age and with uh, little or no heartache. Because I think it must be so, so difficult to adjust from being a sighted person to an unsighted person. And I have great admiration for those millions who have done it and done it so beautifully. Uh, I know a young man in Los Angeles who is a fantastic singer. He's married to a lovely young lady and uh, they have a darling little girl. He's unsighted, but he's done more with his life than a lot of sighted people. In fact, he saved his daughter from drowning he heard the splash of her entering the pool and followed the sound waves mm -hmm. of the ripples to her in the pool and saved her life. And I think that uh, the society is doing so much mm -hmm. and, and, and with so little, when I say so little, with so little in the way of funds. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we can keep this program going is by people volunteering. But I, I don't think we even need to talk about the money. I think if the society only educates mothers and teachers that these facilities are available. Because I realize right now with the economy, times are difficult. And if a child's eyes look okay to the parent mm -hmm. and the child doesn't say, mother, I have blurred vision. So it's easy for a parent to say, listen, I, I know I should have the eyes checked, but they look perfect mm -hmm. and he needs a new pair of shoes and mm -hmm. it's going to cost mm -hmm. me money to take him and have him tested. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is free of charge. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, that the parents will not become apathetic to it. I mean, it's it's available only a phone call away, and it's free of charge. I can only talk about the Miss America pageant because that's the only one I have any intimate knowledge of. To me, it, it was wonderful. Lenora Slaughter, who first took over the pageant in what nineteen. 45, I believe, I, somewhere in that area. She was responsible for the Miss America pageant, and she has now since retired, and I'm very sorry about that, because she's the one who went in and she said, Miss America will not be crowned in a swimsuit. It's undignified. She said they'll be crowned in evening gowns. And the press walked out. And without the press, I mean, there was no pageant, because this was before the, the time of television. Mm -hmm but she would not be swayed. And five minutes after the pageant began, they all came back. And from then on, she had her way. The thing that was nice about the Miss America pageant was I never had to defend it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Miss America never went anywhere on chaperone. Uh -huh. She never appeared at a cocktail party. So 
No gentleman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania or <laughs> could say, oh, I went out with Miss America uh -huh. last night. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no, there was no way. Mm -hmm. And she tried to maintain a lovely image for her girls, as she called us. Mm -hmm. Also, it gave me a $10,000 scholarship, which I used to study acting and speech, ballet, singing in, in New York. Mm -hmm. Also, I got to meet people in every walk of life. I got to meet presidents. Uh, I got to meet uh, all sorts of people that, as a little girl from Matt Brandon, Mississippi, right out of my junior year in college, that I would never have had an opportunity to meet. Uh, what so about for me, it, it, was a, it was a great advantage. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the pageant in the future. I don't know how I will feel about it. In the, in, in the future. But for me, I thought it happened at the right time and it was good. No, I don't think so. I have to be honest. Mm -hmm. I would like to say uh, yes. First of all, I don't think, had it been for the Miss America pageant, that I would probably have had the courage to move to New York. My father was very much against show business because unfortunately at that time, we we're talking about 1958, the most we ever saw about anything pertaining to show business in, in this area were when we, well, we would read about the 16th divorce of so-and-so mm -hmm, or some mm -hmm. wild escapade, and it was not something that a family, I think, would readily say, I want my daughter to be an actress. Not really. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have been very difficult for me. The one disadvantage that I had was that I was not able to start at the bottom and work up. That's a disadvantage because I'd always had singing lessons and dancing lessons and piano mm -hmm. lessons, but. I had never sung with an orchestra until I went to Atlantic City. Oh. I was petrified. I'm sure you were. Oh, and I think, as it has been Miss America, you you can't start in the chorus of a Broadway show and work up. I mean, they expect more from you. So when you got out there, you had to be as good as if you had gone through that apprentice period mm -hmm. of learning step by step. And I was realistic enough to know that I got a lot of jobs because they could use the name, you know, mm -hmm. or the title, former Miss America. Talking yeah. about, uh, I don't know how we're doing time-wise, but talking about 17 years ago, <laughs> uh, my years Miss America, I was in Thomasville, North Carolina for a festival. And they were very lovely to me, and I stayed in a private home. And this lovely young lady came in. She must have been three years old. And she sat on my lap, and I had my picture taken with her. Well, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? I went back to Thomasville about two years ago, and a young lady came over to me, a young woman, mm -hmm. holding a, a little toddler in her hand, oh. saying to me, do you remember this picture? And she had grown up, and she had her own baby now. Isn't that wonderful? And I thought, oh, time really flies by. It really does.